Is it recording? Yes? Yeah, it's good. Okay, good. Beautiful. Yeah, we always have these uh, things where it, it, it hits three hours, and we're like, God damn it. <laughs> we can't, uh, you know. Well, at least you don't have a 30 or 60-minute show. They have to put your commercials in the middle and everything. Yeah. By, the, by the way, I'll give a plug for Legal Zoom that uh, when I first came to California, it took me two days in a law library to get up to speed so I could write my will. And uh, I was glad to see that there's still a discount with Rogan because that's my project this month is to redo <laughs> my will. And, le you know, I've, I've known about LegalZoom for a long time, and it's a really good group. That's another thing that I think the Internet sort of uh, made a lot easier, sort of finding out sure. what your, your rights are, finding well, out it, what, what, yeah. how the law applies. Lawyers mainly know how to use the library and have their secretaries type up all these things, you know, because they got go-bys. And so LegalZoom can take care of probably 95% of all your stuff. How did you go from being a lawyer to running a computer company? Well, I was, uh, I was practicing law in Houston, and uh, we had primarily a, a business law. Uh, my partner and I owned a title insurance company, and we were doing, you know, it was in the heyday in Houston when the <laughs> savings and loan thing was going on. But... Uh, one day, our, our main client came in, and he had a big construction company, and he wanted to sue one of his subcontractors. And, you know, I looked at all the things. I said, well, Jim, you know, you, you can file a lawsuit, but you're not going to win because he's in the right here. He says, oh, I know that. I just want to hurt him. Ugh. So I said, give me just a minute. I walked around to the next office to my partner. I said, figure out what my share of this outfit is worth. I quit. I'm going home. And that was when I, I just, I, I, it had been building up to that because I'd been doing stuff that I didn't become a lawyer to hurt people and do stuff like that. And so uh, I just walked away from it and uh, <laughs> I got in involved in uh, multi-level marketing. Wow. And uh, yeah, I, what I found out is, is that uh, if you say, hey, I'm a lawyer and I'm doing this, people just flock to you. You know, I signed up <laughs> Lots of people. And because you're a lawyer doing Well, multiple. they say, well, if a lawyer's doing it, you know, it's got to be great, you know? So is it like a pyramid scheme? Pyramid company, yeah. We were selling uh, do-it-yourself-at-home do it facelifts. What? <laughs> what? It was, it was before anybody knew about aloe vera, one of the first aloe companies. And it was really easy to sell. We'd do a meeting and a bunch of people would be there, and you'd paint half their face with this stuff. And leave it on for like 30 minutes and take it off. And <laughs> it looked like they're two-faced. You know, one side's a little higher than the other. Sort of like putting, uh, uh, what's that, hemorrhoid medicine on your face or something. <laughs> what, what's hemorrhoid medicine? Preparation, like preparation, preparation H. Preparation H, yeah. What happens when you put it, that it on your face? It just tightens you up. It tightens your skin up for an hour or two. <laughs> so when you put aloe vera well, on no, your face. Well, no, this was a whole bunch of, it, it, it actually did work. It, it did tighten up your skin and get rid of some wrinkles for the really? evening. Really? Yeah, oh yeah, it worked. For the evening? For the evening, yeah, it wasn't perfect. Wow. But, uh, and, and we sold a whole variety of things. Why right? don't like actors do that before they make movies? Well, I don't think you can get this stuff anymore. You can't get aloe vera anymore? Well, you can get aloe vera, but this, was, this had some powders and stuff. You, you use a chemical thing, you mixed uh, it all up. What happened? Did it start fucking up people's faces? No, uh, the company went out of business. Uh, you know, there, there's you know all these. Po you know, I I know a lot about these multi-level companies. They they all spring from a, a vitamin company, a Neutralite, I think it's called, and that's where the uh, DeVos and Van Andel that started uh, uh, Amway Neutra came. Neutralite. It, yeah, I think Amway finally bought them or something like that. But what's that big one? That's uh, the big one with the the leaves. That oh, that's. Uh, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Huge company. Yeah. Well, uh, anyhow. The, Herbalife? Herbalife. In, in fact, one of their, their first vice presidents came out of this company I was in, uh, Ideal Incorporated. But there was uh, Dare to be Great and Coscott and uh, one that uh, the California governor campaign, that guy. Anyhow, I used to know a whole lot about this. And they all sprung from the same core of people at one time. They all knew each other. And I got involved in that for a while, and we were selling all kinds of things. And then my partner and I started a jewelry company, and we kind of fell out. And I was into computers, so I started a computer company. It was a pyramid company. And, uh, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. But, uh, it, you know, I finally lost the faith because for a while I really believed that you could do these things. You know, we had a, a woman who was a German refugee that wound up making $20,000 a month and stuff like that. And so... Those things did happen, but they were so rare. Finally, uh, you know, I was able to uh, see the light 
<laughs> well, it happened after I started taking MDMA. That's when I got out of the motivational business and everything. And uh, the motivational business—that's a slippery business. Uh, <laughs> you know what's is. fascinating to me? People that have never been successful at business but give motivational seminars on how to be successful at business. Yeah, after my computer company crashed, that's what I got into. That's a fascinating <laughs> thing, isn't it? That that people would—it's sort of like you know, like there's comedy classes that are taught by extremely unfunny people. Uh, I believe people it. that have never had a career as a comedian, yeah, yeah. but they decided to start teaching comedy, and then they started making more money teaching comedy than they ever did doing comedy itself. Yeah. It's like a lot of that. Back in Boston, there was a guy that was a terrible comedian who was teaching the local comedy class. And I was like, that doesn't make any, like, what the fuck is going on here? You couldn't get a real comedian to teach a comedy class. They didn't want to have any part of it. And, and you'd be surprised how many motivational speakers are in Great Depression all the time. You know, we'd, really? We'd go back after the thing would be over. We'd get off stage. And, oh, gee, my wife is leaving me, and I'm <laughs> broke, and you know all these things. That's we hilarious. we had more problems than our audience combined, probably. That's you know? hilarious. But you had some good ideas. You just had to figure well, out. Well, yeah, to you know, they, yourself. they they were all you know from hundred years ago. You know, there's right. not much new in that field. It's uh, well, Anthony Robbins is another one, right? Tony Robbins. Yeah. He's a super successful at that. But what else has he done? I mean, has he like had a, like a successful real business? But, you know, when he first came on the scene, I just started kicking myself because I said, "Gosh, I was doing that, and I'm better than him." You know, well, he's very handsome. He's a beautiful. Yeah, man. He, he's got uh, great teeth. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Nice he's skin. He's got. Uh, he has. He had a lot more confidence Good than voice, I had. Yeah. Booming voice. Th but, throws karate kicks. But you know, eventually you kind of push yourself to the end. He started doing all the fire walking and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and and. And, uh, yeah, that's but, fire walking. But, hey, hmm. My wife did it and did not get burned. Wow. The first time. You could do it and not get burned too. Well, as no. You walk quick. I could not do it. Because really? <laughs> I'm not going to walk on fire barefoot. You okay. Know? But if you did, you'd be all right. Oh, the, the, the whole idea is getting through it quickly. If, if I did, I know I'd get through all right because I wouldn't do it unless I was sure I was going to get through all right. Um, you could think that you were going to be all right and not be all right. Well, Depends that's what happened to her the second time. <laughs> How far did she walk longer the second time? I think it's probably the same. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I didn't know her then. I probably I, shouldn't I be talking it. about it. I get it symbolically, you know, but unless it's fuckery, look, we all know fire burns. All right? Why is fire <laughs> not burning? Because I don't believe it's going to burn? Mm. Boy, I'm not sure about that. I think you might be playing games here. <laughs> well, you know, the three laws of taking psychedelics are number one, cars are real. Mm -hmm. Number two, fire burns. Mm -hmm. And number three, gravity is still a law. If yes. you lift those three things, you can't go wrong. That's like the Bill Hicks joke. Did you ever hear the Bill Hicks joke? I've young man on acid, thought he could fly, jumped off the building. And he's like, if you thought he could fly, why didn't he take off from the ground? He goes, <laughs> I did hear we that. We lost yeah. a moron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I remember that. That's, <laughs> it's so logical. <laughs> it is logical. It's like, wait a minute. That guy was an asshole. Now, he was a Houston guy, right? Yes. Bill Hicks. See, yeah. I, I'd left Houston by then. When I was going to law school in Houston, uh, the only celebrity I saw that wasn't a celebrity then was uh, Glenn Campbell was was singing for tips in this bar I used wow. to go to. But uh, I I used to hang out in Lightning Hopkins Bar. He was a black uh, blues guy, and uh, uh, a couple of us would go down in Houston. Hang. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Where was that? Down the Fifth Ward somewhere, the Whoa, Third Ward. It was, really? it was, yeah, and it, we'd have to go in a little group, but we went regularly enough that we got known. We we're the only white kids in there, you know. And, wow. Uh, so uh, one and and he'd you know he'd rap with us and stuff and and i said hey i can play the spoons and he says yeah give the boy some spoons get up here and so i start playing the spoons while he's playing guitar you know and he he stops and he says you're in law school right and i said yeah he says go back to law school you'll never make it as a musician what an <laughs> asshole oh no no he did it in a funny way and oh. I, you know he was he was actually right i couldn't keep a beat you know <laughs> Houston had two of the greatest comedians of all time come out of it. Sam Kinison and oh, Bill Oh, Kinison, Hicks. too. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They had that whole Houston annex down back in then. They had mm -hmm. like a real creative group of young up-and-coming comedians. And they, you know, they started this thing, the, the Houston Comedy Outlaws. And it was Hicks and Kinison and a bunch of other guys. Fascinating yeah. sort of a development. Yeah, you know, I, I went to law school there in Houston. and I taught sailing at Houston Yacht Club. That's how I got there. Well, because of Kinison, they all had like this unique style, this very aggressive, in-your-face, thoughtful style of, of comedy, mm. break, breaking th things down in a very logical way. You know, but but making good points, but also you know being like really bold about it. Well, I heard you and and uh, I think it was Mark Marin talking about Kennison, and, yeah. and boy, that really gave me a whole new uh, 
Marin has some amazing oh, yeah. Kennison stories. When he was on this podcast, he was talking about doing coke with Kennison and you know how he like was hearing voices for like a year. Like they did so <laughs> and much. And he was a young kid then <laughs> when he was with him, you know. But you, can you imagine? He did so much coke, he was hearing voices for a year. <laughs> Whoa, man! Holy, break your brain, Batman! I was lucky. I never liked coke. I was lucky I never tried it. I, 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 the, the same woman that uh, gave me MDMA for the first time uh, she gave me my first line of Coke. And I said, oh, this is awful, man. It's like being in a dentist's office. And she said, oh, yeah, it's always like that in the beginning. But, you know, after, after uh, you know, 10, 12 times, you'll, you'll get to like it. And I said, you know, I went through that with scotch. <laughs> and it's cheap and legal. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to go through that again. Yeah, there's weird things like caviar. It's an acquired taste. Why would you acquire it? <laughs> Why would you acquire something that costs ten thousand dollars and tastes like shit? That's, yeah, that's and ridiculous. and if you don't like it to begin yeah. with, why acquire it? Yeah, why acquire that? That seems really silly. Yeah, <laughs> I never did the cocaine, but uh, I I've had a bunch of people near me that had problems with it. I I always associate cocaine with a lot of negative uh, things that I'd mm-hmm. seen, but one of the biggest ones was uh, I was driving. Uh, with some friends, we were in Revere, Massachusetts, and there was this two-lane road that uh, we were leaving this area that was like, uh, there was this famous place where we'd go, to Kelly's Roast Beef, and everybody would go there and get clams. They had, like, fried clams there. It's like a famous spot. People would travel from mm-hmm. far and wide to go to Kelly's. So we were driving back from that, and there's this people behind us, uh, people beside us in this car were doing coke. And there was a girl in the back seat, and they had the light, the dome light on, mm-hmm. and she was doing coke, and she looks over and sees us looking there, and she goes like this, fuck yeah. <laughs> She's like, as they're driving by, just looks at me, and like anger and craziness in her <laughs> eyes, fuck yeah. And that's how I view coke. Yeah. I view coke as like, that lady, look, I was looking at her, you're doing coke, you have the dome light on, and I'm looking at you, and you're mad at me. Yeah. I didn't do anything. I didn't no, know I've, I've had a few friends that got into it too far, and it's, it's, it's a mess. Devastating. Yeah. It's another thing. It's another one of those things that your body connects to chemicals and become, it becomes a massive part of your life for some yeah. really strange reason. I, I've only done meth twice. Oh, and, that's a weird thing to say. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I would never do it again is because it's the one drug that could hit, hook me. It, wow. Oh, the yeah. first time I did, I didn't even know what it was. I was uh, crewing for racing sailboats over in New Orleans at the Mardi Gras regatta, and uh, the guy that owned the boat was from Houston, and I was in law school there, and he wanted me to drive his boat back. And tra- he was on a trailer, a dragon, and uh, I said, oh, I can't go back. You know, I'm sleepy. I haven't slept in two days. And he says, here, take this. <laughs> he gave me this, and I drove straight through from New Orleans to Houston, and <laughs> I was wired, you know, wow. and... It was about a year later I, I said, hey, I want one more of those things. And he gave it to me, and I thought, you know, I could get really hooked on this stuff. But I never Truck driver even... meth. What? Truck, Truck driver, driver meth. meth, yeah. That's the real meth, right? right. I don't know, but <laughs> I never came near it again after that. I've had some people got in real trouble with that, too, some friends. What is the come down like? It's, it's crash. For me, it was just a total crash. I could once I finally came down. I I, I didn't go to class for a couple of days. You know, when you were taking pure MDMA, you had no crash at all. I didn't. Not you know because nobody knew that you're supposed to. I think. But uh, hmm. the other thing is, I was working at the time, so maybe I was just so busy I didn't notice it. But uh, I never had a come down crash when I was in Dallas. I had a big one. I oh, only really? did it once. The next day, I had to perform. Mm. Uh, I had to uh, do a stand-up set, and I mm-hmm. went to a coffee shop in the morning, and I was reading a magazine. I couldn't read. I was like, I couldn't read. I couldn't couldn't stay focused long enough to get through a sentence. I couldn't get through a paragraph. I couldn't do it. I just oh. I did have it in there. I was like, wow, I am stupid as fuck. I was like, what's going on with my brain? I didn't know about 5-HTP. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about supplementing afterwards to try to re, right. re, re-kickstart your brain's uh, ability to produce serotonin and dopamine. But uh, it didn't, didn't sit me well. I enjoyed the experience as far as like what I got mm-hmm. out of it, but I also thought this would be very dangerous because that reality of the, the, the loving, warm, ecstasy feeling mm-hmm. when you're locked into it is very appealing, and you could want to do that a lot. And then if you wanted to do that a lot, you would experience that more or enjoy it more than you would enjoy regular reality. And then it would, you know, it's sort of like a point of diminishing returns. Oh, like you're it, not getting anything out of you this. You build up a tolerance to yeah. it, too. I, I, I did more MDMA than is, you know, sensible. And because I didn't know what I was doing. See, that was the problem back then. Right. Nobody knew anything about it in Dallas, you know. And we were, ter- oh, it's safe. Don't worry about it. And th- there was just no literature. There was no nothing. How did it get started? Uh, well, 
the, the, I don't know if the story ever really got out, but <clears throat> this guy, we, he went by the name Thomas Crown. He was the, the he was really the mainstay, although uh, uh, <clears throat> there's a guy that, uh, I'll think of his name in a minute, everybody thought was the number one guy in Dallas, but he was uh, a good friend of Tim Leary, and he's out here in L.A., and Tim Leary says, here, try this, and that's when he found it. He says, oh, this is great, I'm going to take it back, and he he lit up Dallas with the stuff. So, wow. uh, but uh, I I actually did a motivational speech on MDMA one time. Whoa! About two hours after I'd taken it, so I was still pretty much up there, and they'd pay me uh, to do a thirty minute keynote speech at this big corporate <laughs> thing. And I was an hour into it when they finally caught me off the stage. Ah! But I had people on their feet. It was one of the best talks I ever gave. Why they they cut you off? Well, They're I was like... only supposed to talk thirty minutes, and after oh. an hour, they said, you know, that's really enough. Wow, that's hilarious. Nobody, there was only one person in the room that knew I was an MDMA. It was one of the women there that, uh, uh, actually, she's one of my distributors. <laughs> <laughs> and what did she think? <laughs> she she couldn't believe I was going to go on, first of all. Wow. And, uh, <clears throat> I did a lot of stupid stuff. Yeah, well, that sounds like nobody really knew what the hell was going on with no, that stuff. You're just really taking didn't. chances. You were yeah. like human guinea pigs. Yeah, I in, in that little interview I did, I told about the time that... Uh, well, I, I took a way excessive dose. What does that mean? Like, what's way excessive? Fifteen hundred milligrams. What's a what's an average? One hundred and twenty is what is that? What you should take? You should you should. What? One hundred and twenty. So yeah. you took <clears throat> ten times? Yeah. And I still have these two cassette, two ninety minute cassette tapes that I filled up talking that whole time. I've never had the courage to listen to them again. But from that time, for another seven years, I tried MDMA about five years. Well. Not long after, nothing happened. Five years after, nothing happened. About seven years after, I finally got MDMA to work again. I only did it once a year after that. And I haven't done it now in, I guess, five, six, seven years. But uh, it, it really fried my brain. Now, you know, Oprah put this bad news information out about the holes in the brain thing. And the night before, or a couple of days before that show aired, her producer was informed by MAPS that this is a, you know, Totally bogus. It was a lie they put out there. There's no holes in the brain. It was a blood flow MRI or something like that. And I, you know, maybe I would be a genius today if I hadn't done that. <laughs> but it, you know, it didn't really fry my brain. Now, it was so stupid. I had a monster headache for three or four days. And MDMA did not work again for a long, long time. But it didn't kill me. And it didn't, I don't think, put holes in my brain. The holes in the brain thing was what everybody said. That was one of those. Well, rumors Oprah, just... Oprah did that. You know, she had this MRA at this this woman, and the woman knew that it wasn't a hole in her brain. <laughs> you know, Maps uh, got a hold of it, and they they really gave her all the information. What this is, it was about blood flow or something, uh, but it was not a hole in her brain. And Oprah's producer knew that going in, and she still let that hit the air. That's sort of so like the Benghazi thing, only it didn't get busted. That's so silly. Why? It's, you know, why? 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 But, but, but you know, I, I think they probably were trying to save people. They're probably trying to, like, scare people off from doing... And maybe in this day and age, when you're dealing with something that's uh, ultimately, you know, cut with a bunch of other shit... Yeah. No, no I would, I would never take something that, that I got at a rave or a party or something like that, that you just can't trust this stuff. And a lot of it's, you know, you don't know who's making it. And we at least, you know, had good sources, good supplies. We knew who the chemist was, stuff like that. But uh, today, it's it's really not safe unless you're the chemist or friend of them. Unfortunately, you know, if all all could be fixed in, but, in a but way, you don't just... need to. You got pot. You know, yeah, cannabis is really the miracle drug. It, you know, the plant does so much things for you. The hemp plant does. The cannabis is really a medicinal plant. You know, it the, certainly is. The, but for PTSD, there's nothing like MDMA. No MDMA. You know, but see, that would be used with with a, a doctor who knows his mm -hmm. supply and stuff like yeah. that. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with dancing. I've danced all night on it too. It's really good. How it's, dare you? Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you were dancing all night on MDMA? Oh, I was in my 60s. You were just learning. Yeah, I'm. I'm just catching up. You know, you kids got Amazing. ahead of me. <laughs> Everybody, they're ahead of us. They're yeah. ahead of you. They're ahead of me. The kids t of today, they they're starting from the jump with yeah. all the information. They, they just need to be cautious. Be, you know, you oh, for sure. You don't have to be crazy about these things. It's just so un unfortunate when we have so many dangerous drugs that are labeled, they're prescription drugs, they're, 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 mm -hmm. they're dosages clearly marked, and right. we know about them, and yet there's these illegal ones that are just floating around out there, and they're, they're in commerce, they're in connection, there's money, money's being exchanged back and forth, right. people are taking them. 
There's no way you can ever regulate that unless you make no. it legal. You can't. You yeah. can't. Yeah, it, it, it's legal, and then you get some kind of a structure to take care of it. But, but then again, the argument is like, oh, well, that's going to be legal. You're going to make meth legal too? Like, ooh. Start with cannabis. Yeah. Well, yeah, and see what happens. You know that. Uh, are, we, are you down for legal trucker meth? If trucker <laughs> meth was legal. Well, yeah, because you could regulate it. Yeah, but still, and it, would be you'd still regulate it and say, you know, like, who needs it? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but still people would use it like crazy they'd be way fucked up on it yeah. like if they would go to the truck stop y- you know I really don't ever give much thought to those kind of things because you know I, I'm not an activist in drug policy or stuff right. like that and so uh, uh, you know mushrooms you can you can grow at home now there's mm-hmm. a new new method to grow them in hydrogen peroxide so you don't have to worry about all this uh, s- you know sanitation stuff what? And you grow mushrooms in hydrogen peroxide? Oh, there's a bunch of YouTube videos about it. I've been out about oh, two years now. YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> 35 hours every second goes up there, something like that. Y- at least, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's just amazing. It's, so, uh, it's a crazy I'll, time. I'll tell you around. another thing uh, not to try, not that it's, it's not dangerous, but, you know, when I first moved to, to uh, Florida, I, I, well, a little after that, several years after I moved there, and I'd lost all my connections and stuff. So <laughs> the, the r- word on the street was that uh, nutmeg was very similar to MDMA, and, mm. and you could take some nutmeg. So <laughs> I, I got one of those little McCormick tins of nut, nutmeg, and I capped it all. And I took, you know, not the big tin, but the... Capped the, it, mean putting Put capsules? them in capsules, yeah. And I took the whole thing at one time. Oh, my God. I got real sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> got a horrible headache. And today at Christmas time, I can't get near the eggnog if it's got nutmeg on it because I'll throw up. That's hilarious. <laughs> to this day, it'll to this you day, out. nutmeg will make me sick. But I have heard of people getting high from nutmeg. So what's that about? That's what I heard too. But well, maybe you have to get the big tin, but the little tin won't do it. <laughs> a big tin of nutmeg. Well, a little tin will just get you sick, but a big tin will get you high. Well, I don't know. I would not try it myself because a little tin convinced me not to try it. Again. Yeah, there were some guys on my message board that were experimenting. With getting yeah, high on yeah, nutmeg. I've heard that. I just don't believe it. Is that on Arrowwood? Do they have uh, trip reports on getting high on mu- nutmeg? Maybe they do. I don't know. I, I know Earth and Fire are friends of mine, and, and it's a really... Sub- Arrowwood.org. That's the first yeah. place to go if you're going to do a drug. Yeah, Arrowwood has And spend horrible... a lot more time there than you spend doing the drug. You yeah, know? Arrowwood, nutmeg, let's find out. They have some horrible stories about about um, bath salts, don't they? Yeah, when somebody asked me, well, what's this like? Should I try this? I said, go to Arrowhead and read the bad trip reports. And if you mm. can't handle a bad trip, then don't go. But don't read the good trip reports. Anybody can handle a good trip. Yeah, there is apparently a, there's a page on Arrowhead. It's all about nutmeg. I love this. Arrowhead provides information about psychoactive drugs to educate, to reduce harms, and to support much-needed policy change. <laughs> you know that, that uh, some of their big customers, or not customers, but readers, are DEA agents, police of agents. Of course. They have a whole separate section for law enforcement and for parents. And See, they started out as just a little database for their friends. And now it's one of the most visited websites on the on the net. It's it's a huge. So site. what did DEA agents go there for education? Is well, to saying? find out more about you know they, they a new drug will hit the streets, and that's oh. one of the first places they'll go to find out what it's about. That's interesting. I wonder if that's how they found out about bath salts. I don't know. I, I, but, you know, they'd find out about it on the street, but to find out uh, trip reports, what you know, how do we know what these kids are on? What's it doing to them? And what do we do to them? Do we take them to the hospital or we put them in jail? And yeah, there's going to come a day when people look back at this day and age and go, "God, they were so nutty." Hmm. Like they just made a well. We're just going to add oxygen to it and fucking sell it. <laughs> you know, we take this. So this is illegal to get you thirty yeah. thirty years in jail for one ounce. This, however, is exactly the same effects plus this other weird thing that it does and you can just buy it as bath right. salts. They're going to go, why, why didn't they fix that? Why did they let that go on for years and years and years? Right. You know, it's crazy people. And polydrugging is a, a real problem with the young poly kids. Polydrugging. You know, putting a bunch of things together. Yeah. Candy and, flipping. Well, you know, some of them are, are safer than others but a lot of the polydrugging is going on with uh, prescription drugs now Ugh. and that's really fucking them up. Yeah, well, prescription drugs are just with alcohol. That's mm-hmm. a scary one. Just you know, in, in the original hearing for cannabis when they were going to make it illegal in 37, the only medical testimony was from the AMA, and that was in favor of cannabis, and they cut the guy off and threw him out of the hearing. Get out of here, you But the only problem. medical uh, testimony in, in scheduling it or taxing it at the time <sighs> was in favor. Yeah, we're in some weird times still. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing that 1937's work... You know, 1930, whatever it was, when they made cannabis legal, it was a 37. Yeah. That to, to this day, it's still effective. Yeah. 
ma- a massive amount of a couple money. generations, you know. They just had to just get grandpa and grandma. Just get them, and then they're going to tell their kids, and they're going to tell their kids, and everyone's going to be scared. Well, now there's a huge movement in geriatric, in geriatric, geriatric medical marijuana. Really, and I know some uh, one geriatric doctor who is uh, prescribing it for his patients. I, I've, I've. You know, some anecdotal evidence of, of older people in nursing homes and all that have had some marvelous things happen to them. So it's it's finally getting into uh, grandpa and grandma doing wow. cannabis. Wow, that's amazing. It's amazing. After all these years, people are finally starting to catch on. Yeah, I've turned on people in their 60s that, you know, were very anti-drug, but they are all of a sudden in all this pain or they're, they're going through can- cancer treatments or something. They uh, you know, they can't keep their food down. And I say, hey, try this brownie, you know, and pretty soon they're, they're going to the dispensary regularly, you know. So. Especially if you've lived your life without it and you thought this is all that's available. And then yeah. all of a sudden you have this new hobby. Yeah. That's, uh, that's... <laughs> you're, you're old. You can't move around much. Hey, you know, there's something I can do here. Reduces <laughs> inflammation, too. A lot of people that have, like, serious problems oh. with walking around, they take some pot and it just makes you all loosey-goosey. There's mm-hmm. a lot of folks that have experienced some pain relief, from oh. it, especially if it's high in CBDs, right? I, I, I use it for pain relief. Uh, and actually, I, I uh, when I'm in pain, I can't tell that I'm high when I smoke it. But the pain doesn't... I don't think it goes away, except you just don't pay attention to it anymore. <laughs> I mean, about, really, I don't know what the mechanism thinking is. Thinking about here. UFOs. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had any experience um, that uh, when you were um, on any sort of a psychedelic that you felt was like some sort of a paranormal experience, like a UFO experience or like being in contact with something or seeing something that you, uh, you, you experienced where it felt like it was a real thing? Yeah, I, yeah, several times, uh, you know, mainly on ayahuasca. But uh, there was there was this one time that is still is just crystal clear to me where there was this. We were sitting in darkness, you know, and it appeared like there was a black curtain in front of me, with just a really bright light coming out from the bottom, and from back behind me, this this female kind of entity. I it was just very dark and shadowy. I said, what is that? And this, you know, this could be going on in my head. I, I admit that. But to me, it was real. And this entity, she said, well, that's what you are really made of. That's your core. Do you want to see it? And she reaches down and starts to pull this up. And it started getting so bright. I said, no, no, no. I don't want I, I got scared. I don't know why. And uh, some of my friends said, I can't believe you didn't let her pick it up. <laughs> you know. But it was, it was like a message like, you are this bright, shining spirit behind this thing. I, to me, that was a real entity encounter of some kind. So you think that that was like an interdimensional thing that you were communicating with? It or? could have been, or it could have been a figment of my imagination. Right. You know, I, 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 I not tried to distinguish between it because the emotional impact of what went on and what I was thinking and saying and afraid to look at my own core was kind of fascinating, you know? Well, it's also, what is the source of the imagination? And why is the imagination so obviously affected by different chemicals? And where does the imagination come from? Exactly. Yeah. Well, the imagination is clearly affected by cannabis, clearly also affected mm-hmm. by caffeine, clearly also affected by alcohol, definitely affected by psilocybin, definitely affected by many, many, many other things. Airplane well, glue will do it. You have ideas that are different than the ideas mm-hmm. that you have if you're in a baseline sober yeah. consciousness. And the real question then becomes, what exactly is imagination? Is mm-hmm. imagination just a series of chemicals interacting with neurons, mm-hmm. interacting with thoughts and ideas and learned experiences? Because out of the imagination comes everything that everyone ever used on mm-hmm. Earth. The thing that wasn't here already, anything we made, whether it's a phone or a television set or a curtain, that all came out of the imagination. So the imagination isn't just something where you think things up and they, well, you know, maybe I just imagined it. Nothing happens without imagination. Exactly. The imagination is the source of Mm -hmm. every single creation. It's a weird thing when you look at it that way. When you don't look at it as something like, oh, you're just imagining things that aren't really there. (laughs) Right. Well, you're also imagining the wheel. You're also imagining internet connections. You're also imagining airplanes. Yeah. Somebody had to imagine all of those. All of that. Without that, there's nothing. Without the human imagination, mm-hmm. the world would look radically different. It would be 100% sure. natural, and we'd be animals. Mm-hmm. 
the imagination is the one step that takes us from animal into animal that changes its environment radically and starts to transcend itself, Mm -hmm. starts to symbiotically attach itself to its own creations, which coincidentally came out of the imagination. The imagination Mm -hmm. created technology that like the glasses you're wearing or the watch I'm wearing or any any of the yeah. things we're talking through, these microphones, all of that is technology created through the imagination. Right. Shoes are yeah. really tech, you know? So but, when you see something and you say, well, maybe it was my imagination, I'm not exactly sure what that means. But, see, I don't really care whether it's my mm-hmm. imagination or some other multidimensional entity. What I focus on, what am I learning? What, what am I feeling, first yes. of all? What's my emotional state? And then what am I going to take away from this? What am I going to learn? And uh, recently a, a podcast I put out, McKenna says something to the effect of, what makes us think that, that the entire cosmos can be understood using the neural network of a primate? Mm. He says, we're here to observe and appreciate. And I like that. You know, Rather than try to figure out black or uh, dark matter and all that, that's great. I'm glad people are working on it. But I'm not going to worry about it too much. I'm, I'm uh, going to appreciate and... and uh, you know, look at the wonder of the world. Just yeah. Look at nature. It's just amazing, amazing what's going on. Just look at all the different varieties of insects. Oh. They're just freaky, weird, alien creatures that we just take for granted because they've always been here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Wasps spiders. Spiders. We yeah. couldn't live without oh, yeah. spiders, you know? Yeah. Or bees. Or bees, yeah. And yeah. that's getting to be a problem. It certainly is. Yeah. And there's a lot of theories about that. But one of the more fascinating ones to me is that they are absolutely convinced that whether or not they can survive it or not, cell phone signals are damaging bees. Got to be. It's, it's fucking with the way they well, and communicate. And people, high each powered other. lines and cell phone towers, yeah. you don't want to live near any of those. Yeah, well, I think that uh, high power lines, has there been a direct correlation ever established between them and sicknesses? Between some high powered lines, not like but a type? The, the real super uh, high frequency power lines. Yeah, there, there have been, in fact, uh, I, know, I know somebody who died of cancer quite young who lived under those for a long time. And now that was anecdotal, but I think there has been, there have been some studies now showing because people in certain neighborhoods have sued and, and things like that. So. I've been around them before where you feel them. Yeah. yeah you can feel that weird. Fe- you, you hear the, mm-hmm. mm, yeah. you're standing next. And you, you can kind of feel thing, a buzz like, around you. Well, you just realize like, this is enough energy to kill everyone you've ever met ever instantly. <laughs> and it's just shooting through these wire lines. But we don't know what we're doing to ourselves with all these electronic signals. You know, you can't get away from it. There's Wi-Fi everywhere now. There's cell phones. There's TV. There's radio. Think of the information that's just in this room that we can't see. Right. But with the right equipment, we can tune into. Well, that's where it's going to be really weird when that equipment is actually inside your brain itself. Yeah. That's going to be very, 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 very strange. It's getting there, too, I think. So close. Yeah. You know, they gave the person the first ticket for wearing Google Glass <laughs> while saw, driving. I saw that, you know. And I think that was a valid issue of a ticket, too. I don't want people driving and looking at Google at the same time or yeah. the net. But I don't I, like people talking on their cell phone unless they have hands free. My question is, how can they prove that it's active? Because if you just have that thing on your eyes, it's I don't not... think you can. I, I think they can beat that ticket, but uh, <laughs> I, I think it sends a message. Yeah, that it's... cops don't like technology. <laughs> that, well, they like the technology and they have. <laughs> it's also the other message is they like writing tickets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They want to write as many as they can. And yeah. they, they have to fill quotas. Filling quotas is one of the most disgusting things anybody ever got away with. The idea that yeah. there has to be a certain amount of crimes that are committed in a month. Huh. Like, what if everybody agreed to only go the speed limit for like a year? What would happen? Would the police officers just explode? I mean, what would they do if we all agreed? That, that would be an interesting uh, project in some small town if we could get everybody to do if it. Then nobody has any money that's coming in from, yeah. from speeding tickets. What yeah. do they do? Because they rely on it. You know, they rely on it for a source of income. Well, there's a couple little towns on the way to Burning Man. That's, that's most of their income is But isn't that tickets. insane? I mean, look, it's one thing if you want to ticket someone because you want to give them an incentive to slow down to make people safer. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. But as soon as you start developing, like, you have a standard amount of money you have to make every month. from mm-hmm. pe- You're just saying that people never improve. You're just saying that people will never get better at following right. the law, never get better at being safer. And just the fact that you bank on that, you have a quota, that's disgusting. But there's, there were known speed traps in, in Texas, you know, that you wouldn't go through this town because it was 15 miles an hour and 16 and get you a ticket. And Connecticut's horrible is because it? Connecticut, between Connecticut and Boston, there's a lot of stretches where it's 55 fucking miles an hour. And not and 56. 
Olympics. Yeah. And there's <laughs> nothing there. It's yeah. just straight line. And you just want to gun it. You want to get to New York. Yeah. But between New York and Boston, it's like three and a half hours at 55 miles an hour. We're just going, <laughs> Jesus Take Christ. Train, yeah. and everywhere you look, some asshole disguises a tree pointing radar at you. Yeah. <laughs> So stupid. Yeah. And now, when uh, Jamie put up a picture just a moment ago, but now in uh, in Colorado, they're developing this new technology to tell if someone's smoking pot and not look at these things. S tell if someone's smoking pot enough inside of a building for it to, the smell to leak outside. So they've You're developed kidding. this instrument that uh. measures the amount of cannabis smell in the air on the street, and they're going to start to give people tickets for these things. Yeah, oh, that'll help vaporize your sales. Well, this is in Colorado. I, I, we made pot legal. I, this is so fucking stupid. Those are the 40% that didn't vote for it. It may be that, or it may just be the fact that people are just fucking out yeah. of control, and they're just weeds blowing everywhere, like you know, like tumbleweed. You know, like the smell of weed just wafting through entire communities, and people are catching contact ties, and they've had enough. Well, you know, it used to be you'd put your pot in, a, in coffee. <clears throat> and the dogs couldn't smell it for the right. coffee. Now they've trained the dogs to look for the coffee as well. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but a friend of mine told me that, oh, what he's been doing is buying uh, uh, bear piss and wolf piss and sprinkling it around his tire tires and in his trunk because he says when a drug dog smells it, they go crazy. They forget about drugs totally, and they want to go attack a bear, you know? Whoa, so I don't what know do if the cops do? When well, they... I, don't, I don't know. I, this probably is made up. But it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't think it would be made up. I mean, dogs instinctively freak out when they smell wolves, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, it beats coffee. Yeah, that seems to make sense. That's, hmm. I wonder if they can get in trouble for, like, pasting wolf piss on your tires. How do they prove that? Yeah, I don't know. They, <laughs> they have a wolf piss nose thing, <laughs> too. Know. They put it on. and Bring in the wolf piss dogs. <laughs> <laughs> they have a wolf piss detecting device, just like they have a cannabis smell yeah. detecting device. But there's some, some sense that a dog can't resist. That's Do you know the one way. scent that supposedly universally applies to uh, all animals? It brings in deer, brings <laughs> in elk, brings in moose. Beaver piss. Really? Yeah, beaver smell or beaver huh. beaver estrogen, whatever it is, beaver scent. I know a lot of young men that go after beavers. Yeah. Exactly, which is interesting, that term beaver, because mm -hmm. they don't look like... Look, if your woman's vagina looks like a beaver, take her to a doctor. <laughs> There's something wrong. It's not supposed to look like that. So if you're calling it a beaver, why are you calling it a beaver? Because somebody else did before you. Right. Because yeah. it's, Well, then the, other, the other idea is that it was created back when they were really hairy. <laughs> I mean, we don't know before about Before the that internet. Today. Before porn. <laughs> before an internet porn, yeah. Yeah. Porn in the internet. I yeah. think porn got women to trim it down a little bit, and the the internet came along, and it was just it was just fire through bushes, <laughs> just fire. the the pubes just Bush all fire. vanished. <laughs> but apparently, the uh, the scent from the glands of beavers huh. is uh, the the best sexual attractant wow. for other animals. Never uh, yeah, go figure. Yeah, I, I don't know what that's about. I mean, maybe, who thought that the beavers were the studs of the <laughs> animal world? <laughs> They're certainly a weird fucking animal. Oh. I mean, if you see one in real life, oh, yeah. you know, and you see their crazy houses that they build next to the lakes where these giant I lived on a little lake in woods. Florida, and you take a canoe and pi you know, paddle out there, and there was a big beaver dam there. You could watch them, and they were busy as beavers. Busy as beavers. Yeah, and there were otters around there. And people eat them. <clears throat> Apparently, I guess, people yeah. eat them. Apparently, they don't taste bad. I don't know. I guess when people They'd are like, starving to death. You know, I watch uh, a lot of those uh, Alaska shows mm -hmm. where people live in Alaska and eat whatever they can get yeah. a hold of. And a lot of people eat beaver up there. They eat beaver tails. They cook the beaver tail. That sounds like it'd be pretty tough. Seal. They eat a lot of seal. Marinate it. Yeah. Seal and beaver and, you know, got to eat what you got to eat. Gotta yeah. Eat whatever the hell you can get a hold of up there. Probably if you didn't know what it was. You'd say, hey, this is kind of interesting meat. Well, we, they just can't be picky. They just need a source of calories yeah. and, and protein. Little protein, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's right there. Mm -hmm. Take it. You know, and apparently seal oil is very important for them because it's very high in calories and the cold that you deal with. Mm -hmm. Apparently, that's one of the, the best, the worst um, uh, losses of c calorics or of calories is your body burning off uh, calories to, uh. to keep itself warm. It's like one of the best ways they say to lose weight is to actually to uh, walk around with like less jacket or less huh. coats than you would feel comfortable with because your mm -hmm. body, in order to keep warm, is actually burning off energy. Oh, that's interesting. So are you going to go hunting in, in Alaska? No, I'm going in Wisconsin. I'm going actually really? this weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. What are you I, going after? I would, go, I would go in Alaska too, though. 
What are you going after? Deer. Ah. Yeah. There's a guy who's got a farm that's overrun with deer, and he brings in mm. people to hunt them, to manage them every uh-huh. year because, the, you know, the, the reality is, as you said, especially in Wisconsin, a lot of them are going to die by predators. Yeah. A lot of them are going to get hit by cars. A lot of them are going to freeze to death. And you, you, in order to keep the herd healthy and yeah, manage them, you got to thin it. You got to thin it. And you've got to be the wolf. And I want to. I want to try to live this entire year. I want to. I want to pick a time like after the first of the year. And try to live the entire year on game meat. That'd I think it's great. possible. I think it's possible. I think if you're going to be a meat eater, you know, mm-hmm. to know the exact source of your meat, I think it's probably the best, the most ethical and sort of sane way right. to do it. The, the disconnect between us and our food, whether, like, I love growing food in a garden and then mm-hmm. cooking and eating the vegetables mm-hmm. that you grow. I mean, I think it's a beautiful thing. It's a, it's an interesting connection right. that you have between where your food actually comes mm-hmm. from. I have chickens now, and I get oh, I good. get fresh eggs from the chickens, and I'm trying to get closer and closer right. to my food. If that makes any sense. Well, we eat mainly organic, or almost all organic, but mainly vegetables. We eat chicken maybe twice a month, and we have a friend that slaughters his uh, his pig once a year, and and we know how it's grown and raised and everything. But uh, mainly vegetarians. But all of our food, most of it, comes within. Uh, 25 to 40 miles of our house, you know. That's great. We belong to one of those CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture, and, and I do most of the cooking, and so uh, it's really fun. You get this box each week, and then you got to figure out what you're going to do with stuff. And uh, That's really cool. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I would love that. I think I, I've talked to my friends about that. Everyone's so goddamn busy. We never get anything done. But the idea of getting together, everybody buying in on a plot of land mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. hiring someone to run that plot of land and produce food for this group of people. Like, say, get 20 people together and say, well, this is our grocery bill for the year. Mm-hmm. If we can manage a, a plot of land and buy a plot of land together, everybody pay for one twentieth of it or whatever, and then hire someone to take care of everything and hire a few people, There's rather. There's got to be some CSAs up here. Uh, there must be. I don't it, know, you know about that. There's them. several of them in San Diego County, and, and we've belonged to, to this one for quite a few years now. And they supply uh, most of the local organic stores. Mm-hmm. And so what we're getting is, are the, t- the tomatoes that are... Uh, well, they're heirloom. They're not perfect. They're in. We're getting food from a farm like it would come, and not everything's the same size and shape and all like that. It's real but food. It's, and it's real food. It's picked that day or maybe the afternoon before, and yeah. it's, it's real good, fresh food. But that way, we don't have to get a, our own group together. Now, right. we've gotten a bunch of people involved in this, and some people don't like pomegranates or persimmons or whatever comes sometimes in the basket. And so we swap around with each other mm-hmm. and stuff. And uh, so we usually eat everything, so I get all the throwaways from everybody. My idea had a bit of doomsday to it. My idea was right. like if the shit hits the fan, be Well, you're into survival stuff, and, and, you know, you read all that, too. And, and when I was younger, I was into that, too. But now that <laughs> I'm, I, you know, my dad, my brother, and my mentor all died at 63. So I'm eight years past my expiration date. So, so you I'm, feel like it's all free time? Sure. I'm just in <laughs> No, I exercise. I eat well. But, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, I'm not stressed about that. I see the Google kids are, are working on longevity uh, things now. And, and I just commented to a friend yesterday. I said, y- you ever notice that... All of this at longevity work is done by people in their 30s and 40s, but by the time you're 70s or 80s, you say, oh, no, I, I don't really need that. I've had a lot of fun. I want to have a little bit more fun. But, you know, if you gave me, you said, here's a pill, it'll give you another 100 years, I'd have to think long and hard about that. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you would worry about deterioration or because no. you're not having fun? Uh, well, because uh, there's a lot of pain in watching your friends go through what they're going to have to go through. Everybody's mm. going to go through love affairs that are broken and tragedies and stuff like that. I just don't want to watch any more of that. You know, wow. I, 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 uh, love affairs. <laughs> That's the big one that pushed I, you over the edge. Well, no, it's, I'm thinking of my grandkids now. Oh, they're getting their hearts broken. Oh, and everything. that's funny. That's like, <laughs> we were talking about the radio lab thing earlier about the guy who went through this horrible circumcision process yeah. of becoming a, a, a runner. Wouldn't want his sons to go through it. Yeah. You yeah. don't want your fa- your kids to go through heartbreak. Right. Now, I, my, my children have already gone through heartbreak. It's now it's my grandkids. And it's I, important. I told this w- one of my grandchildren, I said, you know, if I'm not around when some young man breaks your heart, <laughs> I will come back and haunt him. <laughs> Why? And, and she, she remembers that. <laughs> well, the guy, is, why is it his fault he doesn't want to be around her anymore? Well, see, I'm, I, I have four, five grandchildren, four girls. Mm-hmm. 
If it wasn't for that, I'd have a little problem with women, but I, I have a new sensitivity to women. <laughs> oh, I have a very good sensitivity to women, too, and I have three daughters. But my point is that a lot of heartbreak comes from the fact that people just decide they don't want to be with you anymore, right. and it doesn't work out right. And people think that when someone leaves them that they're taking something away from them. They feel like this deep sense of loss, and they're connected to the idea. Part of growing as a person is realizing you're going to be okay. And, and here's where MDMA would be really cool if it was legal. Because mm. when you and your partner get to the point say, you know, if it's bad for one person, it's going to be bad for both of them, even if you're not talking about it. So if you sat down, got together one evening, just the two of you, did MDMA, and talked it out. Now, I know from personal experience that, you know, my marriage, my uh, previous marriage was really getting rocky when I found MDMA. And we stayed together another six, seven years. Is that good? Yeah, it really worked out good. Yeah, because well, it died the, after the, that. Well, the kids were grown. Well, a lot of things happened after that. <laughs> <laughs> but but it did uh, extend our marriage mm-hmm. and and extended it in a really good way. Oh, that's good. And we were married twenty one years, and we're we're good friends now. We, we, there was a rocky period for a while, but we've uh, you know worked ourselves through that to where you know we both respect each other and we realize that it was not a one way street, mm-hmm. but. Uh, you know, I th- I think that MDMA would be great for couples therapy of people uh, when they hit that seven year mark or whatever it is. You know, that yeah. They get to. Well, I think there's a lot of things that people hold in and they repress in relationships mm-hmm. and don't communicate about. And then sometimes a psychedelic journey together can open those ideas up, and you start talking about things, and you find out that this been a misunderstanding all along or that it could have been a lack of communication that you could have worked things out much better much easier a long time ago or that you're both feeling the same way that you both want to move on you just don't know how to do it and you know i've had one experience where i i went on for months something was building up and finally you know i got it out and she said huh that's no big deal (laughs) you know and it's something that had been a big deal to me for a long time and it turned out if i'd just been talking about it i would have had a month of bliss instead of hell you know so Communication is the key, and and there are some things that help you communicate. Pot helps you communicate. Yeah, and don't you think that those things and those heartaches and those, that's part of what makes you a person? It's oh, information. Yeah. You have to get that information. It's feedback. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't want to not have any of my heartbreaks and stuff like you just that because they were. I just don't want. I don't want to see it happen to somebody. Else. I understand, and I I agree to a certain extent, but I think it's very important that everybody goes through a certain amount of it just to understand oh, yeah. what well, it's about. Well, you don't have a choice. You're going to you go through it anyway. Look, I've had friends that have gone through it where I know they, they became better people because of it. I have oh. a friend who went through a devastating breakup, and now he laughs about the idea of being stuck with that woman. You know, but, back then he thought there was no way he could live without her. And I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter what happens to you, how big the tragedy is, that after some enough time passes, eventually... That becomes one of your funniest stories. Oh, I doubt it. Oh no, Jesus that's Christ. <laughs> some of these things. What if your were... kid was eaten by a wolf? Oh in front no, of you? you know that's what a little. What are you talking about? No, that's that's. I'm thinking what about. What if you fucking saw your family die in a plane crash? Okay, I'm what? thinking things happen to me. <laughs> oh fucking Christ! But, you know, if you think about some things that happen, seem to be a tragedy at the time, and usually they're not between people. You know, car breaks. I'm just talking stuff. about like breakups. I'm talking about like getting fired. I'm talking about things that are not really devastating. Like getting fired is a good thing. I've had that happen sometimes. And that's, that, that can turn into a good thing. It, yeah, it can be a changing experience, and change, I think, oftentimes opens up the door for good. Yeah. You know, change opens up the door for good because it gives you a newfound focus. You know, if you new... survive it, you're going to be stronger. Yeah, every time I've, like, had something happen to me where I had to rethink things, that's always been a good thing. Oh, yeah. And when you yeah. get fired, you're like, all right, what are we doing here? And you all of a sudden you and, get this new motivation. And I realize, objectively, this would be a good thing for my grandkids when it happens to them. I just don't want to go through it. <laughs> That's part about being a grandpa. I, I mean, know. isn't that what they always say, that the strictest parents were always like the most lenient grandparents? I, I wasn't a strict parent. <laughs> well, even more so then. You're even more lenient. But uh, Yeah, the yeah. idea, especially when you're an older person and you've experienced so much pain and hardship and you see the innocence of children. Mm-hmm. It's how, how beautiful it is. That they're, they don't know any racism yet. They don't know any homophobia yet. They don't know any blind, right. unobjective hate. They don't know, they, they don't know the disillusion of government mm-hmm. they don't know all this right they don't know any of this yet they don't know like you know re- re- you know the, the 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 rebellion against taxing and it's mm-hmm. like all the different aspects of society that you know bring people to this hysterical freak out point where you're like this fucking thing is i'm mad as hell and i'm not gonna take it anymore like I network love <laughs> right i love that yeah they don't have that no they have you know you stepped on my toe 
They have uh, that's my toy. You know? But relatively speaking, these are big problems for them too. I mean, sure. all the, the little kid problems that, that uh, we just have to learn how to work our way through them. My three-year-old has a way bigger problem with my five-year-old taking one of her toys than I have with anything in life. <laughs> my five-year-old takes her toy and she's like, "That's mine!" She screams, tears are flying out of her face. That never happens to me. Yeah. So for her, that's a devastating apocalypse. Yeah, it's a huge apocalypse problem. of toys. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's relative, relatively yeah. speaking, and you have to address it that way. You have to sort of respect the fact that they actually are freaking out. And although it doesn't seem normal to you, mm-hmm. you're a grown adult. Right. But for a three-year-old, this is a fucking real you've got real to, you've got to acknowledge that this is a real serious <laughs> thing for them, you know? And so you've got to treat them like adults. My know? parents didn't. Shut up! You know, <laughs> that's how I grew up. Shut up. Shut your mouth. I'll break both your legs. That's the type of shit I heard. <laughs> I was I was really lucky. I, I grew up like in an Ozzy and Harriet family. It was school. Really? It was my problem, you know? But my, I couldn't have asked for better parents. They're that's amazing. Incredible. Yeah, and we were, Look how you turned out. Ecstasy dealer in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> Sends him to college and he deals uh, drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Hosting a drug podcast. <laughs> the guy's crazy. What is this book that you wrote, The Spirit of the Internet? Uh, that's that's. Uh, I wrote that in 2000, actually. It's it's one of the first books that compares the Internet to a psychedelic drug. Speculations on the evolution of gl- gl- global, global consciousness. consciousness. Yeah. Wow, look at you, you fresh-faced little yeah, young. Yeah, that's a long time ago. That's, 2000? Uh, you yeah, when you wrote this? That's in 2000, yeah. 13 years ago. Yeah. Isn't that I, amazing? I, that, I, that was, 13 that was years the last ago? nonfiction I wrote. I've got a fiction book up now that's the uh, first of a quartet I'm writing, but uh, uh, I, I went to fiction because it's so much more fun. Do you remember? So did Graham Hancock. Did you do you remember when people thought that the the world was going to end in 2000? Oh yeah. Y2K. Y2K. That was well, a big deal, man. See, see, I got involved in Y2K in about 1995 because we we set aside millions of dollars to fix all those problems. And most of the software industry did. I mean, th- there was a huge thing, and the press only picked up on it in the last, you know, nine months or something. And we'd already spent millions of dollars and years and years of work. There's specialized companies working on it. And so I really didn't think anything bad was going to happen. I wouldn't want to be somewhere on an airplane right then because there were, were going to be a few <laughs> glitches. <laughs> well, I didn't, no, I didn't think the airplane would crash. Oh. I thought I could get stranded somewhere and they couldn't get my reservations or oh, something. Oh, right, right, I wasn't right. worried about the plane itself. That was a fear, though, like air traffic controllers, that their, their computer systems were going to yeah, go down. Th- there was a potential for that, but it was nothing like the press made it. What the fuck did they do for air traffic controllers before they were computers? Eyeball, I guess. Radio and eyeball. Like in the 1960s, what, what, how did they describe, like how, I guess it was like uh, coming in at 30,000 feet, you know, 25 degrees north I latitude. I guess they talked them down. I don't know. Wow. I, I'm a commercial pilot, by the way. I've got commercial, Are you really? But it's restricted to hot air balloons. <laughs> You're a commercial, <laughs> it, 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 a commercial pilot, though? and it says restricted to lighter than air aircraft. <laughs> lighter than air aircraft. Yeah. That's I, fascinating. I, used, I, I don't have a balloon anymore, but I used to fly balloons, yeah. Whoa, that's got to be spooky. Oh, they're great fun. You what know? is that like when you're up in a basket near uh, space? It's it's just awesome because now it gets loud when you burn, but then you, when you're not burning, you're just floating and it's quiet. And you can hear the sound. You know, there's no no obstruction. So you can hear oh people talking God. on the ground. And in Dallas, there was this, this one Christ. track that we would take on Sunday morning because there was a, a woman who would lay out in her backyard by the naked? lake naked. Yeah, Hollow. And so we would come in. We'd burn, and then we'd we'd come up high, so that we'd coast down in low and come over the lake, and just and then we'd say good morning. <laughs> She'd jump, you know. How but, rude! Yeah, it it was. Uh, you could hear everything. You know, you, you, in Texas, of course, you'd fly over on Sunday morning. You see pickup trucks with people passed out in the back of them and stuff. Wow. <laughs> we'd yell at them. How dangerous is it, though? It seems like it's pretty dangerous. The reason I quit is because I wasn't paying close enough attention. I almost hit a power line, <sighs> and. It scared me so much. I, and I was flying people for money and stuff, you know, at the time. Oh, my God. I, I got wrapped up in the conversation these guys were having. That's my problem. Mm-hmm. I'm paying attention to them more than the flying. And they didn't know we had a close call. I knew we had a close call. How close? Not that close. Close, close enough. I, I, I was coming down, and I didn't burn soon enough. And so it takes a while to get your momentum back up. And, uh, you know, I cleared it by 50 feet. But, you know, I should have cleared it by 500 feet or something like that. And I was coming in for a landing, I guess. And anyhow, it, it scared the hell out of me. And I said, you know, that's it. How many people have died hitting power lines? Oh, lot, that's mainly what's happened to people in balloons. You know, oh, that, uh, God. Not, not, not all that many compared to the number of people flying. You know, it's safer than regular aircraft. Now, are you harnessed in when you're up there? Oh, no. 
Oh, Jesus. No, I used to sit on the edge of the basket, you know, and burn. And... Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, fucking A, man. What if a crazy <clears throat> rebel wind came along and knocked you off? Well, you wouldn't have launched. <laughs> if it's over 10 miles an hour, you wouldn't launch because oh, you have a lot of trouble. God, that looks so spooky. And, I'm and just we'd go curling to, my toes just sitting here looking at that video. We'd go to these air shows where they'd bring in, you know, biplanes and stuff like that. And for the balloons, they would put up a, a pole in the middle of the airfield with a keys to a Cadillac or something on it. And you had to go five miles away, anywhere in the radius of five miles away and launch, and whoever could grab the keys got the balloon. But, wow. What if they collide into each other? Well, re- well you'd kind of bounce off, but uh, you ha- oh. if you're at the same altitude at least. But you, the, oh. rules of road, so you're not supposed to do that. But nobody in any of the things I ever flew in ever got the keys. But you'd have a bean bag too, so you'd throw that, and whoever got closest would win money or something like that. But wow. It's great fun, you know. That my, my ex-wife took me on a balloon ride for my 40th birthday. And on the way back, I said, well, how much do these things cost? How do you get started? And the next morning, I was taking lessons. Yeah, I, I had a lot of money then. How much does it cost to get a balloon? A uh, balloon's about 35000 It was 35, back when, when I bought it, yeah. And how, what, how do you fold that bitch up once you're done flying? Oh, they pack into a, a basket that's, uh, no, maybe a, a third of the size of this table. Wow. And, and, and But then you have your basket, too, so you have a, a trailer behind your And car. do you have a parachute up there or anything oh, in no. case the shit hits the fan? Oh, no. Uh-uh. Nothing? No. Nah. Dude, I, I had ballsy. I had one guy wanted to pay me to take him up in a parachute, but I, and he wanted to jump out, but I didn't oh want to do it because once the, once the guy jumps out, you get so much lighter, and if you're not care- if you shoot up too fast, you'll collapse the envelope. Oh, you know, that no. that doesn't happen very often, but <clears throat> they're really safe. They're really safe. They're a lot of fun. And uh, wow, that sounds scary. That, that was how a, do you lower yourself? <clears throat> do you have to lower it naturally? Well, the, the there's a hole in the top, uh-huh. and you have a, a line that goes through it, a rope. Uh-huh. And you pull it and bleed air out of the top and let it go. Oh. And then when you're when you're actually landing, the top is held in by Velcro. And so, <laughs> except for the little flap that's open, when you're you're just ready to land, you rip that. It's called pull the top out. You pull the top out, and then it'll deflate and land down. Oh, Sometimes Jesus. your landings are a little rough. You know, I've had landings where I dragged for 50 or 100 yards <laughs> where I bounced up and all. You know, that, that uh, conditions sometimes make it tough. And... In in North Texas at the time, you had to be really, you know, you can you're allowed to land anywhere when you're landing. You know, the FAA lets you because you if you if you out of fuel, and, and there was this one farm up in North Texas, up uh, by Cisco, I think it was, and and whenever the balloons would come in landing, you could see dust coming on these gravel roads from two directions. One would be this farmer with his pickup and his shotgun, and the other would be the sheriff to come to protect you because the farmer hated you landing on their lawn. Uh. You know, when ballooning started in France. They they would carry a bottle of champagne to give to the farmer when they landed as, hey, thank you for letting us land here. Here's the champagne. When ballooning started in the United States, the balloonists never gave it to the landowner. They drank it themselves. You know, uh, champagne and propane, breakfast of balloonists. How rude. That's why they ruined the whole thing. Yeah. Look at this that, crazy. That looks like Albuquerque, yeah. There's one in Colorado, too, in Colorado yeah. Springs we went to. Yeah, the woman that uh, taught me to balloon uh, moved to Colorado Springs to... Yeah, we fly. went there to see it, but there was bad weather, so they never launched. Yeah, it's, See, you've got to do it, you know, at sunrise and sunset, you know, the, a couple hours until uh, after sunrise and a couple hours before sunset. That's the only time the, the air is stable enough. Have you ever met anybody that was up in a balloon and saw a UFO? No. No, I mean, it's too early in the day. Or, mm. Plus, you're looking at other things. How convenient. What, what most people like to do on their first balloon ride is pick leaves from the top of a tree. Wow. For some reason, that's a big thrill, you know. So we'd go over and skim the trees, and they could pick leaves. Wow. <clears throat> that's weird. Great fun. It's weird that we figured out how to float, <laughs> float around in the sky. Yeah. You know, it's just a matter of time before we figure out how to do it with suits. You know? Well, you know, they, some jetpacks are coming around pretty good now. Yeah. So, uh, well, they've got guys that have those wingsuits that oh, jump yeah. off of cliffs. Those psychopaths. Are awesome. <laughs> these guys <laughs> are nuts. Oh, I can, oh hold, I can hardly watch those videos it's sometimes. It's so hard for me to watch. Oh. And there's one where a guy crashes. It's really hard to watch. Yeah, that one I haven't seen. But it's just a matter of time before they figure out something with a uh, like a wing. Something yeah, well, that's got it, wings on it. those th- that technology is going to grow. I think. Yeah, it's just, everything's going to grow. You know, I mean, if they have a jetpack now and they do, mm-hmm. you know, I watched one when I was in Denver. Uh, there was uh, my friend Willie has a, a KLG. What is it? KLPJ. KLPJ. Um, the radio station had a guy come in. That's a. Uh, uh, th- that had a uh, jetpack guy come in, and he launched a jetpack in the parking lot, and flew through the air for like ten seconds. Okay. You can only do it for like ten seconds, and it was like within you know x amount of years we're going to be able to do five minutes, and then 
you know, X amount of years after that, they think they're going to figure out some sort of power source that's yeah. going to be a, a, able to make it a, a viable mode of uh, transportation. But it was very complicated as far as, like, the controlling. Oh, it's got to be, yeah. The yaw and what is it called? There's, like, two. Pitch. Pitch and yaw. Yeah, apparently it's, like, it's not a simple thing to figure so out how to do we it We didn't right. have to learn that to get a license for balloons because, you know, just up and down. And you had to what do they have to learn? Weather, clouds. Uh, uh, you had to learn about procedures with the FAA because you have to call the FAA in the morning and get a weather report and all, and you'd tell them where you're going to launch and so they'd know some balloons are going to be in the area. How much different is that than a blimp? Can you, can you target a blimp? I've never been in a blimp. But Did you pilot one with your license? Oh, no. No. It's lighter than air. Well, hmm. Maybe I don't know anybody uh, crazy enough to let me do it, but yeah. I guess I guess that would be legal. <laughs> it's lighter than aircraft. Yeah. Do you have to renew that license, or is that once you get it, you got it? That's the that's the crazy thing. <clears throat> you you don't ever have to renew it, but you have to have a check flight every year, I think, with a, somebody else who's a, a commercial pilot. So all you have to do is get a friend to go up, and take a ride with you, and and you're current again. I'm not current. What was <clears> that when <throat> you just put up, Jamie? Lady Gaga in a dress that flies. Lady Gaga, the actual Lady Gaga? Yeah, there's a guy. It's like remote controlled. And uh, Oh, so is it Lady Gaga or is it a toy? No, it's Lady Gaga. I think it's so her. Lady Gaga is in a jetpack. Okay, here she is. She's got a helmet on. Let me see this. Liz, you're showing us after it's over. So she climbs into this fucking thing and flies around. I didn't think jetpacks could be annoying, but I was wrong. <laughs> Look, there's Lady Gaga in a jetpack. <laughs> Humans, we ruin everything. This is so stupid. She's connected by wires. Shut this off. This is a fucking charade. <laughs> it's not even really a jetpack. She's all wired up and everything like that. It's more like a little helicopter. Yeah, that's horseshit. <laughs> that's what that is. It's wired. But, you know, there have been guys going to the stadium, football stadiums in those jetpacks. Yeah, well, there's that one guy that landed. Uh, he was in the middle of a boxing match. Vander Holyfield was fighting Riddick Bowe, and the guy landed. Uh, he had, like, a parachute connected to fans, and he called himself, like, the fan I, man. I know what you mean. Remember that? <laughs> And they landed, and it delayed the fight for like a half an hour while they had to arrest this guy yeah. and bring in police, and they beat the guy up and everything like that. And then it, it sort of changed the uh, the atmosphere of the fight because there was a big break in the right. middle of the fight. Right. Everybody cooled off and then had to go at it again. Uh, but that was... Well, uh, I saw one of I used to walk on the bluffs down by Del Mar, which are, you know, up maybe 30 feet or something. And one day, a guy came by in one of those. He was a parachute, had a big fan on the back, and, and he was at eye level with me. And he says, you know, hello, hello. <laughs> and he's moving very slowly. Yeah, this is the video. Riddick Bowe and Evander Holyfield are fighting. And look, they stop, and they're like, what the hell? And they're looking, and it's boom, the guy lands ringside in the crowd. They should have turned Hol Holyfield on into him, let him go. Well, they're in the middle of a uh, fight. They, he has other big, more important things to do. They just beat the shit out of this guy, though. I can see why. You know? I think that guy's probably still in jail. Or I'm surprised they didn't just reschedule the fight. That's not really fair to do that, is it? <sighs> well, I think people wanted a conclusion. Yeah. You know, it was all yeah. going on And right all the money and there. And, but yeah. And all the money on pay-per-view as well. Those poor I mean, fighters, though. Yeah, you know what? They should have just started it up immediately. Shouldn't have waited a half an hour. Yeah. Just to give it a little five minute break, cut the cords, just let's do this. But it was, I think it was quite a quite a break while they arrested this dummy. Gee, needy bitch. That's it. That's an example of a needy bitch. That's they should have those fights indoors. <laughs> yeah, I think they probably mostly do. Yeah, I mean, you very rarely hear about fights outdoors. I know they do a few occasionally outside in Vegas. Yeah, there's, there some. was a big one uh, way back in what was it, in Africa or something. I can't remember it. Uh... They do uh, Muay Thai ones. They do, um, they do Muay Thai ones uh, in Vegas outside. Hmm. Well, it doesn't get quite as loud, I think. Yeah, but it's also your, your, the environment is different. You're dealing with outside. It can yeah. rain. It can yeah. get weird. You know, I went to a, um, a King of the Cage used to have um, these fights outside. I went to a couple of them. They used to have them in um, an Indian casino in, in California mm -hmm. back when mixed martial arts was illegal in California. So they would hold them in this outside casino. And one time, they, uh, it started raining. It was pouring rain out. And so they decided to let the fights continue in the pouring rain. So these people are fighting, they're slipping, and they're trying to throw kicks, and they're falling on their ass, and people are climbing on top, and they're, pull they're soaking wet. It was like Jeez. the craziest, and they released it as a DVD. I think it's called King of the Cage, Wet and Wild, but it's a really insane series of fights where people are trying to fight in a torrential rainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> 
People are just so did, nutty. Did you ever hear of an old, long time ago wrestler named Gorgeous George? Yes, sure. I saw Gorgeous George wrestle. My dad took me to see him in the Elgin High School gymnasium, and the big deal, he had long hair. Well, it was maybe almost down to his shoulders, but not quite. But at that time, it was huge. And his, 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 when he'd come out in the ring in the beginning, he t- his hair would be up, and he'd take bobby pins out of his hair and throw them out to the audience. I was so disappointed I didn't catch one. That's so funny. <laughs> Gorgeous George. Gorgeous George. <laughs> That's another thing that people would come, if they came here for another planet, they'd be like, what the fuck is going on there? <laughs> the, the, those guys are not really hitting each other. Like, why are you watching that? Because <laughs> well, it's fun. Know, we got to find out who's going to win. Who's the <laughs> champion of the world? You right. Know? Like, what? This week. Yeah. We're strange. We're strange. Floating around in balloons, pretending to hit each other. <laughs> what a nutty race. Listen, man, this has been a lot of fun. It's been great fun. Very I'm, enjoyable. I'm, I'm I think really, four hours uh, is enough. Really glad to get to uh, to meet you. And I don't think you realize what you're doing, but you you are you're filling in a role here for a lot of young people that you know you don't know how smart you are. Maybe you do, but you're you're extremely well read. You know so much. You're talking to Graham Hancock about stuff. I read the headlines, and you know all these terms about the skull and stuff like that. But what you're doing is you're taking a, a really a, a high-level intellectual product to the masses and to especially young people that maybe hadn't had the advantage to go to college or something, and they find out, hey, they're as smart as anybody that went to college. And you're really doing a really good service with these podcasts. Well, thank you, but I'm not trying, and I'm extremely that's uneducated. That's why it's working. <laughs> that's, why, that's why it's working. <laughs> I'm extremely uneducated. No, but, but you're very well read. Well, I read a lot of things, yeah. but, you know, I mean, what is education if not if reading? But as far yeah. as, like, formal education, and it, as also as far as, like, I don't, you know, I, I just like what I like. I'm in, interested in certain things, and I find that there's a lot of things out there that are fascinating that people just aren't paying attention mm-hmm. to. And I think what what I see uh, and what we talk about on the podcast is really re- reflected by mm-hmm. what I see on Twitter and what I see on the Internet, when I see, when I go to the various websites mm-hmm. that I visit for information. I see just a, a massive new upsurge in curiosity. Right. I think the people are way more curious than they ever have been before just by virtue of the fact they're getting more information than they've ever gotten And they before. can get it, you know. Yeah. It's not being held back. So I think what this podcast is, we came along in the right place at the right mm-hmm. time and it was the right type of person in me that kind of can bridge a few different worlds exactly. together. Exactly. That, that's what you're bridging, quite a few different worlds. And I that's really important I connect the meatheads and the potheads. Exactly. I'm the bridge between <laughs> the meatheads and the potheads. We're not all that different. You know, no. we might look different, but there's there's prejudice against people who, you know, engage in martial arts and exercise, mm-hmm. just like this prejudice against people who smoke pot. And sure. some of it's justified and some of it's not. Yeah, there's assholes in every group, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's so easy to define people yeah. because of that. You know, mm-hmm. and I think that uh, conversations like this and podcasts and it's, it kind of gives everybody a better sense. Yeah, you know, you, we're getting into people's heads because you're right in their ears. You know, they got the earphones on, they're listening. It's theater of the mind. You know, and, yeah. And uh, it's it's uh, the old voice in the in the back of the mind that you, you hear. You know, I've heard so many, many of your podcasts that you know I feel like I've known you all my life. I know? feel like I've known you a long time too, <laughs> man. I've listened to you on many a road trip. <laughs> give the introductions to all these different various psychedelic talks. How many episodes do you have? Uh, I just last night did three seventy eight. Wow. So you are on episode 419. You almost got right. on 420. Yeah. <laughs> oh, You right. know what? We were going to do a special 420 episode, but now I'm like, well, that's so stupid. I'm so tired of that whole yeah. 420 yeah. thing. It's just like, come yeah, on. What, it's just a number. The podcasts are the podcast. I mean, we, we it, and I'm kind of hypocritical because we always like make a big deal of each 100 that mm-hmm. we hit, but 420 just seems stupid. It yeah. seems like a tired thing. Like, 420, dude. <laughs> Like, come on, stop. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about for 400 what I've been working on. It's not too far along yet, but I've, I've cut out little sound bites of McKenna, you know, 30 right. to 60 second sound bites. And I have about 100 of them from 100 different, you know, talks he gave. And I'm going to try to spring, string them together in a cut up and try uh. to make it a single cohesive type thing. Hasn't been working too well yet, but uh, it's th- worth a try. I think that's one of the cool things that you do do that's kind of scary and dangerous and sacrilegious. You, you edit McKenna's speeches. <laughs> I get a lot of grief. People fucking it. freak out. Why'd you cut out the stuff about the stone date theory? <laughs> well, because it's the 80th time you yeah, said it. Yeah, we've heard it. Yeah. You know, I'm not a historian. My right. job is to get the, you know, I'm a carnival barker. And all of the masters, uh, copies are going to Arrowwood of all the masters. And then the, the real master tapes and all are going to go back to uh, Finn McKenna. Beautiful. So, That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And, and they're out there now. They're out there. You can get a hold of them. Yeah, I've got about another 100 McKenna talks nobody's heard yet. 
we, in, including me. Hundred. Yeah. Oh my me. God! Wow. So I'm I'm good for another year or so. And plus, we're doing the Planky Norte talks at Burning Man. That gets we had another thirty or forty every year. Wow. You changed your name because of Burning Man. Yeah. That's I, ridiculous. I'd, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you know you get too high when you it, change your name. My friend Aubrey did that. He used to be Chris, and he became I, Aubrey after I'd a I'd been working trip. up to it, and, and my, my ah. sister-in-law who died had called me Lorenzo all the time. Oh, so it was okay. a family name. And, okay. and and then I'm at Burning Man, this damn parrot cl- climbs up in my arm, and I said, what's that parrot's name? He says, Lorenzo. And I said, oh, that's my name too. And that was the day I changed it. Wow, that's hilarious. <laughs> it was really hard for my wife and family, but they, they finally <laughs> got there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the Twitter <laughs> is Psychedelic Lozo, L-O-Z. Oh, so uh, follow on Twitter, and the podcast is the Psychedelic Salon. It is available yeah. for free. It's on iTunes, and can people donate if they want to? Yeah, that's that's how it's kept alive. I how can't, do they can't afford it. They, you know, I've got a, a donate button on the Psychedelic Salon. Us has a donate button. I'm putting us. 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 Yeah. Com, uh, com net org or us. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> and, and it all goes to the same place. And then uh, I'm going to put a Bitcoin thing up there, too. So. Beautiful. And they can go to LorenzoHaggerty.com, and it has links to a little 15-minute video of my life, and then the, the MDMA story in Dallas is there, and all the all the links are at LorenzoHaggerty.com. Outstanding. And the book, The Spirit of the Internet, is back when he was Lawrence. So yeah. that's Lawrence <laughs> yeah. Haggerty. I'm looking for Lorenzo. It's not out there. <laughs> the Spirit of the Internet by Lawrence Haggerty. And the right. Genesis Generation is my novel that's just out. Beautiful. All on, on Kindle. Thank you, sir. It's been hey, a lot I of appreciate fun. it. Really it's been an honor to be it's here. Cool. Thank it's cool. It's an honor for me as well. It's really so, cool. And, that we and do I think this. both of our audiences uh, cross a lot, and so I'm glad they both got to hear it. Absolutely. And, and I, like I said, I think that's how I heard about you in the first place. I'm pretty sure. So. Well, I've got a lot of people in my audience say the first time they heard about me was from you. So <laughs> <Beautiful>. <laughs> what goes around comes around. It, indeed, it does. Thank you, sir. Appreciate You're it.